We've got a great number with us this morning, and we are certainly glad uh, that each of you is here today. And uh, we want to welcome you back at any opportunity you get if you're visiting with us. As always, we have some following along online. We want you as well uh, to be a part of our services in person as you get the chance to do that. There was a, a woman who was on her way to church on a Sunday morning, much like we have been today, and uh, her car broke down. And uh, she was exasperated, she was desperate, and so she opened up her Uber app and she called for an Uber. And so an Uber driver came and picked her up and uh, was on the way to take her to services. And uh, she wanted to make sure that the driver knew the way, and so she leaned forward from the back seat and, and tapped him on the shoulder. And when she did that, he jumped, startled, swerved, and wrecked. And, uh, you know, nobody was injured, but she, she was extremely apologetic. She, she, you know, went to the driver and said, I'm, I'm so sorry, I, I didn't... I didn't mean to distract you and to startle you like that. And he said, well, it's not really your fault. You see, this is my first day as an Uber driver. For 25 years, I drove a hearse. <clears throat> Hopefully you understand uh, the punchline of that. I'm going to listen while some of you explain that to your wives and husbands or children as it may be. Thank you for being here. You can open your Bibles to Deuteronomy chapter 9 this morning. Deuteronomy chapter 9. Maybe you'll notice that this service is, is not really any different than our usual services in terms of the format. Uh, we didn't begin this uh, at sunrise as maybe many do, although you know, for, for all intents and purposes, when we have services is, is, is not a matter of fellowship. Why then is this not really any more different than our other services in terms of, of how we're undertaking it. Certainly, uh, a good portion of the religious world has set this time aside to consider the resurrection of Jesus. And there's never a bad time to think about the resurrection. But if we think about it, the resurrection should be a part of, of every service. It should be a part, really, of everything we do. We're going to talk this morning about what to do when a problem seems too great. And maybe from a surface examination, you might ask yourself, does this have anything to do with the resurrection? But I want you to stop and consider this for a moment. Uh, what you see depicted in the, in the graphic beside the title is a man attempting to push a, a large boulder up a steep incline, and that's representative of tackling an enormous problem in our lives and attempting to move forward with the weight of that problem pushing you back down the hill. But I want us to understand that if you and I are able to overcome anything in this life, and if ultimately we are able to overcome death, there is one reason and one reason only. And it's that our Savior has already done the very same thing. In 1 Corinthians chapter 15, if you were to read the first four verses, Paul there outlines the foundation of the gospel. In 1 Corinthians chapter 15, he says that I delivered unto you first of all that which I also received, and he walks through the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. And that is the gospel, he defines it, that he has preached unto them. Now the gospel is the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ and everything that is connected to it, including what a person has to do to be saved, how we worship God in spirit and in truth, and all of those things are connected. And then he goes on in 1 Corinthians 15 to prove that you and I can enjoy a resurrection. And that in fact all of us one day will be called forth. And our bodies will be changed. In verse 26, Paul makes the point that the last enemy to be defeated is death. Our Savior began that ultimate victory over death when He 
defeated death. When He rose from the grave. And that is the foundation of everything that you and I have the opportunity to enjoy and to partake of as Christians in this life and for eternity. In just a moment, we will partake of the Lord's Supper. Even that, that commemorates the death of our Savior, is connected to His resurrection. What did Jesus promise His disciples? He said, I will not take of this until when? Until I do it new with you in my kingdom. You know what Jesus was implying? Death isn't going to defeat me. We recognize this morning, whatever it is that you need to overcome, the power of Jesus' resurrection is the power by which that will happen. So go with me then to Deuteronomy chapter 9. And, and, and as we think about that in those terms and upon that foundation, what do we do when a problem seems too great? If you have lived for any length of time, if you have dealt with any types of trouble, then you have likely run into a problem that on first examination seemed like it was too great. It was too difficult to overcome. And those, those problems, those troubles could be on any part of the spectrum of the difficulties that we have in this life. They could be health related, they could be relational, uh, they could be financial, they could be related to sin and iniquity in our lives. They could be any number of things. But as we think about tackling a problem, we go to Deuteronomy chapter 9 and we see Israel doing the very same thing. Tackling a problem that seems at first glance to be too large. If you begin with me in Deuteronomy chapter 9 and look at verses 1 and 2, Moses began with these words, Hear, O Israel, thou art to pass over Jordan this day to go in to possess nations greater and mightier than thyself, cities great and fenced up to heaven. Verse 2 says, A people great and tall, the children of the Anakims whom thou knowest, and of whom thou hast heard say, Who can stand before the children of Anak? Moses says, we've been wandering in the wilderness. We've finally, by God's providence, been brought to the brink of the promised land. We're going to cross over the river Jordan, and we're finally going to enter into that land. But we're going to have to go against what seems to be an insurmountable opposition. We notice, first of all, the size of, of Israel's armies. They've got giants there. In Numbers chapter 13 and 14, the, the ten spies came back with that report. It's a land flowing with milk and honey, but there are giants in the land, and we are in their sight as grasshoppers. The size of the armies that they're fighting. You see as well the stability of their cities. Fenced cities, cities great and fenced up to heaven. That's Deuteronomy chapter 9 and verse 1. You've got well-defensed cities, You've got armies composed of, of massive individuals. And then you know we can't defeat them anyway. The cynicism of the people. If we had time, we would revisit Numbers chapters 13 and 14 where those 12 spies went and spied out the land and where two of them only, Joshua and Caleb, said we are well able to overcome them. The other ten said there's no way that we can defeat those people. They're going to demolish us. They're going to destroy us. And we just can't do it. And that's why that entire generation died in the wilderness. They wandered for 40 years until all but Joshua and Caleb had passed because of their unbelief, because of their refusal to accept that they could defeat that problem that lay in front of them. And now here they are again. The next generation facing the same problem. And it's just as daunting in their view as it was when they began. What are they going to do about it? What is the resolution? They couldn't change the nature of the problem. Israel couldn't just, uh, you know, swipe their hand across their face and shrink the armies. They couldn't necessarily snap their fingers of their own volition and take away the defenses of the cities. All they could control 
was their mindset. And what Moses, by inspiration, is going to tell them in the next few verses is exactly that. Israel, if you're going to defeat this problem that looms large on the other side of Jordan, you're going to have to remember four things. This morning, is there a problem that is threatening to overcome you, that seems too great, that seems too massive for you to overcome? If you will remember these four things, then it's my hope that you as well can be well prepared to overcome whatever problem stands in your path. Number one, Moses told the nation of Israel that they needed to remember that God will go over before them. I want you to pick up in verse 3. After saying the Anakim are there, The defensed cities are there. He says in verse 3, Understand therefore this day that the Lord thy God is He which goeth over before thee. I want you to understand something. You're not crossing over the river Jordan by yourself. God is going in front of you. And that is a connection to the assistance and the guidance that God had provided for them all the way for their, during their journey, even up to this point. In Exodus chapter 13, God promised that He would come before them in a pillar of cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night to guide their way, to, to light their path. God said, I'm going to go before you. The formula is, you go and I will go before you. Now that sounds very simplistic, doesn't it? It sounds maybe almost trite. It sounds cliche. That if there's a problem that seems too great, you just need to remember that God goes before you. But there is no greater instruction that you and I can remember. In Hebrews 13 and verse 5, the Hebrews writer says, Let your conversation be without covetousness. Be content with such things as you have. For God hath said... I will never leave you, nor forsake you. This promise that that undergirds everything that God has, has done and will do for us. I will not forsake you. I will be there with you. But notice the first part of Hebrews 13 and verse 5. Let your conversation be without covetousness and be content with such things as you have. You, you've got to understand that your circumstances are dependent upon God. And that He will guide you. He will direct you. We recognize He will do as He's promised. Throughout Paul's epistles in the New Testament, there are statements such as this, Now the God of peace be with you all. God with you. The God of peace. We see it sprinkled throughout his epistles. In Philippians chapter 4 and verse 7, the peace of God which passes all understanding shall keep your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Verse 9, the God of peace. God of peace will be with you. In 2 Timothy chapter 4, as we follow Paul to his death, facing that final enemy, I want you to pick up with me in verse 10. Paul says for Demas, he says in verse 9 to Timothy, do your diligence to come shortly unto me. And then in verse 10, for Demas hath forsaken me, having loved this present world, departed to Thessalonica, Crescens to Galatia, Titans un, Titus unto Dalmatia. Only Luke is with me. Take Mark, bring him with thee. He's profitable for the ministry. He goes on to say in verse 16, at my first answer, no man stood with me, but every man forsook me. I pray God that it may not be laid to their charge, notwithstanding the Lord stood with me and strengthened me. And he goes on to say, the Lord shall deliver me. Verse 18. God with us. And it is not trite. It is not cliche to remember that God will be with us. Us plus God any problem that we face, anything that we endure. I want you to file that away. We'll connect it as we move forward this morning. Number two, 
We need to remember as well that wickedness will be defeated. I want you to go back to Deuteronomy chapter 9. And there in verse number 3, he said, I will go before you. But then as you continue in verse 5, Not for thy righteousness or for the uprightness of thy heart dost thou go to possess the land. We'll talk about that in a moment. But for, he says, the wickedness of these nations, the Lord thy God doth drive them out from before thee, and that he may perform that which he sware unto the fathers Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. We need to remember that wickedness will be defeated. What does that have to do with a problem that seems too great? Have we ever faced some seemingly insurmountable problem and, and we've looked around and said, well, well, that wicked person isn't facing what we're facing? This person who doesn't follow God, they don't have the problems that we have. Why should I devote myself to God when He says He'll be with me, but I'm suffering and they're not? And that, that envy and that jealousy can overtake us when we see the wicked. In Psalm 73, that's what Asaph said. He was envious of the foolish when he saw the prosperity of the wicked. And so often we find ourselves enduring the same. And we say, I just can't believe that these people who are unrighteous and wicked and so unwilling to follow God, that they don't suffer as I do. What God is telling Israel in Deuteronomy chapter 9 is, I will punish the wicked. And that's comfort for Israel as they go against these wicked nations. Deuteronomy 7, 1 through 6. He describes how Israel is not to intermarry with them. Why? Because of their idolatrous ways. Because of how they will turn their hearts away from God. These wicked nations, the Canaanites, the, the Amorites, the, the Hivites, and all of those other nations are uh, uh, overcome by idolatry and wickedness. And God says, I want you to remember that their wickedness will be defeated. And you and I need to remember the same. In Galatians 6, verses 7 and 8, Be not deceived, God is not mocked. Whatsoever a man sows, that shall he also reap. We recognize that those who sow to the flesh shall of the flesh reap corruption. Those that sow to the Spirit shall of the Spirit reap life everlasting. But I want you to notice in Romans chapter 12 a specific point relative to this. If you're here this morning and there is trouble in your life and there is a situation that seems insurmountable and you find yourself looking around at others and, and you're envious and you're angry and you find yourself wanting to lash out at those who aren't suffering in the way that you're suffering, I want to bring your attention to Romans chapter 12 and I want to remind you of a very powerful lesson connected to the fact that God will punish the wicked. In Romans chapter 12, you pick up in verse 17. And Paul says, Recompense to no man evil for evil. Provide things honest in the sight of all men. If it be possible, as much as lieth in you, live peaceably with all men. He goes on to say, Dearly beloved, avenge not yourselves, for, but rather give place unto wrath. And then here's where our connection is. For it is written, Vengeance is mine. I will repay, saith the Lord. Imagine pushing that, that boulder up the hill as you see that man doing and looking around at people on flat level ground and saying, why am I suffering and struggling while they're not? One of the key components in Deuteronomy 9 is remembering that, that God is going to bring all of this into judgment. That the playing field will be leveled. And it's not our place to to sit in judgment on them or them or them for the situations that they find themselves in compared to me. It's my job to deal with what's before me and to let God be the avenger. To let God be the one who settles those accounts. But instead, verse 20, If thine enemy hunger, feed him. If he thirst, give him drink. In so doing, thou shalt heap coals of fire on his head. Be not overcome of evil, but overcome evil with good. And that's our obligation as we seek to overcome a problem that seems too great. Number one, remember that God is with you and He will go before you. Number two, remember that God will defeat the wicked. Number three, and this might seem strange, 
Remember that you're not perfect. What does that have to do with defeating a problem that seems too great? Are you telling me that the problems that I'm dealing with in my life are, are my fault? Well, no, not at all. Not necessarily. I can't say for sure. I don't know uh, who originally designed this illustration. I can't say for sure where that boulder came from. I can't tell you where he's coming from or where he's going. In the same way that I can't diagnose the problems with which each of you is struggling right now. And the source of those issues. And that's not what I'm talking about at all. But I want you to go back to Deuteronomy chapter 9 and I want you to notice what God says. Again in verse 5, He says, Not for your righteousness or for the uprightness of your heart dost thou go to possess their land, but for the wickedness of these nations. And then in verse 6, notice what He says. Understand therefore the Lord thy God giveth thee not this good land to possess it for thy righteousness. I want you to understand Israel that these blessings don't come to you because you deserve them. And there is a lesson in that for you and me. Let's continue. He continues in verse 6 to say, For thou art a stiff-necked people. There's not much worse that could be used to describe somebody in the Old Testament and even moving into the New Testament than, than stiff-necked in, in the sense of stubborn, unyielding, unwilling to acknowledge fault. In Exodus 32 and verse 9, God calls them stiff-necked. In Exodus 33 and verse 3, He calls them again stiff-necked. Chapter 34 and verse 9. In Acts 7, Stephen looks back on Israel and he says, back then and now, you are stiff-necked and uncircumcised in heart and ears. Israel was stubborn. And they were rebellious. And often they did not do what it was that they were supposed to do. Well, dear friends, as we look at the problems in our lives that might be overwhelming us, it's so easy to fall into this trap where we say, I, I don't deserve this. I'm better than this. I don't deserve for this to happen to me. Well, well, certainly there are lots of things that happen in our lives that we didn't deserve in the sense that we've done nothing to cause those things to happen to us. But it's a good exercise for you and me on occasion to step back and to really consider ourselves. Go to Titus chapter 3. In the New Testament, this principle underscores everything that we do. Titus chapter 3, here's what Paul says to Titus. In verse 3, beginning, he says, For we ourselves were sometimes foolish, disobedient, deceived, serving diverse lusts and pleasures, living in malice and envy, hateful and hating one another. But after that, the kindness of love and of God our Savior towards man appeared, not by works of righteousness which we have done, self-righteousness, but according to His mercy He saved us. By the washing of regeneration, renewing of the Holy Ghost. It's so easy to say, I don't deserve this. But isn't there a hint of arrogance in that thought process? Because if we're not careful, what we're implying is, I don't deserve this, but they do. I don't deserve this, but someone else might. And dear friends, we would do well to remind ourselves that as a human race, we are all in the same boat. And we all fall woefully short. We need to consider what we deserve versus what we have. Years ago when Danielle and I were just starting out, we were really benefited by Dave Ramsey's teachings on finances. And some of you might be Dave Ramsey fans, some of you maybe not, and that's neither here nor there. But every time someone would ask him how he was, his response was... Better than I deserve. Now, let me ask this, and, and again, I don't know what you're facing. I don't know what problems you may be dealing with. I'm not minimizing those. But is there ever a time when that can't be said? Better than I deserve. Don Wanamaker was mentioned in our announcements this morning, as were many, many others who are, are sick, very sick. 
I never cease to be amazed when I go to visit people in those conditions, and so many of them still have the viewpoint that they're blessed. That they have so much for which to be thankful. When we give in to the poison that we don't deserve this, that we're better than this, that this shouldn't happen to me, that's going to take us to a place that will make it very difficult for us to overcome the obstacles in our way. But if we remember, you know, no matter what's going on, I am better than I deserve. What a much better attitude. You see, Israel's problem so often was a sense of entitlement, a sense of arrogance, a sense of, of an overestimation of their own worth. God, we don't deserve to be wandering around in the wilderness. We don't deserve to drink water from a rock. We don't deserve the manna. We don't deserve to live in tents. We deserve something so much better. And God reminds them, wait a minute. What you have is a blessing from me. And I would do well to remind myself of that in times of trouble. And in fact, we would all do well to remind ourselves of that. So number one, God will go before us. Number two, God will defeat the wicked. Number three, we're not perfect and humility is certainly in order. But number four, we need to remember that God is faithful to His promises. You go back to Deuteronomy chapter 9 and we skimmed over a, a statement at the end of verse 5. Moses says this to the nation of Israel as they're preparing to cross Jordan to fight those great armies, to take on those defensed cities. Not for thy righteousness nor for the uprightness of thine heart dost thou go to possess their land, but for the wickedness of these nations the Lord does drive them out from before thee, and that he may perform the word which the Lord swear unto thy fathers, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. God says, everything that I'm doing for you is built upon my promises. God says, when I make promises to my people, I keep those promises. In Genesis chapter 12, the promise was made to Abraham. And he reiterated that promise time and again. And he restated that promise to Abraham's son, Isaac. And he restated that promise to Isaac's son, Jacob. And he reiterated that promise to Joseph. And it echoed through the ages that God's promises would stand firm. Dear friends, you and I can stand on the promises of God our Savior, just as we so often sing. 2 Peter 3.9 is a passage that very likely you've heard numerous times. The Lord is not slack concerning His promise, as some men count slackness. Let's unpack that. The Lord doesn't forget His promises the way that people do. I have missed appointments. I have forgotten commitments. I have overlooked responsibilities. I have even neglected promises. But our God will never do that. He will never forget or go back on His promises. In 2 Peter chapter 1, verses 3 and 4, Peter reminds us that we've been given all things that pertain unto life and godliness through the knowledge of Him that calls us to glory and virtue. Whereby, by those, are given unto us exceeding great and precious promises. We have great and precious promises. This morning, whatever it is that you might be facing, whatever trouble that might be uh, threatening to overcome you, you and I have great and precious promises provided for us by the faithfulness of Almighty God through His love, 
through His mercy and His grace towards us. Concerning Abraham himself, in Romans chapter 4 and verse 20, it says, He staggered not at the promises of God through unbelief, but was strong in faith, giving glory to God. You see, as you stand where this poor fellow is, pressing against the weight of great burdens, the strength that can keep you there and that can push you forward is faith in the promises of God. We mentioned at the outset this morning, Hebrews 13 and verse 5, for He hath said, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. That's a promise. If God said it, He meant it. Dear friend, make no mistake about it. God is alive and well today. He works in the lives of His people. He hears our prayers. His ears are open to the righteous. God hears us. God can affect your life and mine through providence. God desires to assist us through the burdens that we face in life. But do you notice what Moses didn't say is, well, I'll make those armies smaller. I'll make those defensed cities less defensed. And he says, no, I will help you to defeat them. Now he did that in a a variety of ways. In Joshua 6, they marched around the city and the walls fell down flat. And in various times in Israel's history, there are various ways that God defeated those enemies that lay before them. Today, it will be through your actions and God's help. Through His providence, you can defeat the troubles that lay before you. We recognize this morning that what we can do when a problem seems too great, number one, we can remember that God goes before us. We can remember, number two, that the wicked will be defeated. We can remember, number three, that that we're not perfect and that what we have should be the focus rather than what we think we deserve. And then number four, God is a God who keeps His promise. And as we think about those things, it ought to help us re-examine the troubles that lay before us. There's nothing before me that God can't see me through. There's no temptation taken you but such as is common to man, Paul would say in 1 Corinthians chapter 10 and verse 13. But God is faithful, faithful to His promise, who will not suffer you to be tempted above that you're able, but will with the temptation, the trouble, the trial, also make a way of escape that you may be able to bear it this morning. Whatever is before you, there's a way of escape. There's a way through. There's a way over. There's a way around. Isn't there the old uh, bedtime story? Is it about a bear? I've heard it about different things. Can't go around it. Can't go under it. Can't go over it. What do you have to do? You've got to go through it. But you go through it with God going before you. And that's the difference. And that's what God told Israel in Deuteronomy chapter 9. I'll go before you. And through me, you will defeat the enemies that lay ahead. This morning, the same can be said for you and me. What enemy are you facing? Maybe you're here this morning, and you have recognized through study of God's Word, through contemplation of your own life, that the greatest enemy that you're fighting right now is sin. Sin is in fact the greatest enemy that any of us will ever face. Whatever is going on in your life, none of it compares to the problem of sin. Why? Because Romans 6.23, the wages of sin is death. Spiritual death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Maybe you're here this morning and there's sin. And that sin is the greatest problem in your life. Can we help you to overcome that problem? See, God's provided a way. 
And it wasn't because I deserved it or you did, but because of His great love wherewith He loved us. He gave His Son. If you believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, John 3.16, Jesus tells you to repent of your sins, to change your life, Luke 13, 3 and 5. Peter preached in Acts chapter 2 to people who were, who were convicted of their own sin. Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of your sins. Do you need your sins forgiven? The blood of Christ, which you contact at baptism, can do just that. It can wash away your sins. Acts twenty two sixteen. 16. Dear Christian, are you trying to push a boulder uphill? Is there trouble that is threatening to push you back down. Remember, God goes before you. Remember, wickedness will be defeated. Remember, it's about what you have, not what you deserve. And number three, God is a God who keeps His promises. That's what God told the nation of Israel, and that's what God can tell you and me today. Do you need to obey the gospel? Do you need to be restored? Do it now, as together we stand and sing.